Thank you for checking out this talk from the Fierce Families Conference that took place back in October of 2023. Our mission for this conference was to put God's design for marriage and family on full display, and then to equip marriages and families to live out God's beautiful design in the context in which he's placed them. So if you'd like to learn more about the Fierce Families Conference, perhaps to attend a conference in the future, or to bring the Fierce Families Conference to your own area, just go to fiercefamilies.com. And I guess I'm batting clean up tonight. Sounds good. Love that I had, uh, I got to hear my wife's bio. I wanted to point her out. Where is she? Becca, where's my baby? There she is right back there. Check her out. Cute as a button. There he is. And my two sons, give me one of these. Way hands up. There's my wild and crazy boys. Y'all are awesome. Crazy in like an endearing way. Some of you moms were like smugly look of like, oh, well, that, that's not, no, like wild in a good way. Like, yay for that, but disciplined and cool and you know, they, they're crazy, but they got like seatbelts, you know, they're, they're good kids. We've been married 17 years and it's going very well. Really love being married to that woman, uh, though I will be straight up. Uh, I'm, some of those years were hard fought, especially our first two. First two years, first few months was really good. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But then it was uh, followed by two years that was quite challenging. Uh, I'm a strong personality. Some of you are able to discern that. Bravo, good job. Spiritual gifts in effect. And if you meet my wife, you'll be like, oh, she's strong too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. And that is the story of our first two years. We weren't very good at marriage. And we also just didn't have, I'd say, the direction we wanted to go with marriage. A biblical foundational marriage wasn't very clearly modeled for us. And we had all kinds of baggage along the way. Some of the baggage that we carried in is a lot of the societal stuff. It's the feminism movement. The feminist movement wants to see men as toxic and abusive, uh, unfit to lead, even if they don't say it in that direct stuff. It's kind of in the ether. Right now, we, we're immersed in a third wave feminism, which basically means it, it's like out there whether we even know it or not. We're the most feminist civilization since the dawn of mankind right here. And the feminist movement uh, that's been rolling for decades has ruined a lot of marriages. Uh, you could also say the chauvinistic one as well uh, has also ruined a lot of stuff. And anything that amounts to undermining the fact that a team should be uh, side by side, hand in hand, uh, male leadership, uh, woman as helper, on point together for Jesus. That's the way we do it. And it's worked very well, but it was, man, it was real hard, uh, hard fought for. There's the feministic movement. Uh, Ryan gave a nod of the cap to the Manosphere, the red pill movement. Have y'all heard about this? Shockingly enough, marriage is going out of style. I never saw that coming, you know? Because, girl, you know, you, you're pretty, you know, and I'm like, hey, I like pretty. And so I'm like, hey, oh, marriage. It didn't dawn on me. I know some of y'all are realizing, like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> I get that a lot. Thanks for noticing. Of like, I didn't see marriage going out of fashion. Uh, but it is. There's a red pill movement, kind of like the feminists that say, we don't need men. Men are being like, well, we don't need to marry women. Uh, in the, the, our times are so depraved, you can kind of play house for a few years and there's not much incentive for marriage. Now, this is where it gets real sad. For a lot of the red pill movement guys, they don't understand the benefits of marriage because they've never actually seen a healthy modeled one. If they had seen a healthy biblical marriage, they would totally get why people do it. There's some statistics I'd like to read, and this is just to show how bad the state of marriage is in that people are marrying less than ever in the U.S., and they're, if they do marry, they're marrying later. In 1940 to 1944, 80% of all women were married by the age of 25. If you're a woman living in 1940 to 1944, 
80% of you are married by the age of 25. Now, fast forward, 1990 to 1994. For those of you who are like me and think math is evil, I'll do it for you. That's 50 years, 50 years later. Now, 30% of women are married by the age of 25. Again, math is evil, I'll do it for you. That is a drop of 50% in as many years. 50% drop. People are not getting married, and if they do get married, they're getting married later and later. Uh, I loved what our previous speakers had to say about some of the cultural phenomenon reasons uh, for this, because they're absolutely dead on. Uh, but there's some, uh, to underscore that, to just agree with that, there's some voices out there. One of those voices is, is if you get married, you're not going to be happy and fulfilled anymore. My wife uh, dealt with this because she was on track to be like the career woman and she had all the accolades and she was doing all the stuff in college and she was being groomed to not need a man and to establish herself uh, as this career woman. And when finally she hung a bunch of stuff up and she says, I really just want to be married. Uh, I want to be married and I want to start a family. It's unbelievable how many women looked at her like she gave up on her dreams. Have, how many of you girls, I want to see a show of hands. How many of y'all have felt that kind of, that condemnation that, under the surface of like, oh, just family? You're not working? You're not doing anything with your life? You're just married and kids? Have you felt that? How many of you have felt that? Why'd you give up on your dreams, ladies? Why'd you give up on your dreams? And immediately you want to react against that. I'm like... Man, is your nine to five so much better than children? A family? Really? Come on. No one's going to remember what you did nine to five and 20 years from now. But your kids are going to be this ripple effect that spreads. Anyway, this is the lie. As illogical and as demonic as the lie happens to be, here it is. If you get married, you're giving up on your dreams. You will be unhappy you will be unfulfilled. The hunt is over. The adventure is done. Now you'll settle in to a forever lame monotony where intimacy dries up and withers. Ouch. Does sound bad. That's the cultural lie. Here's another one. You won't be free. Because the self is exalted... That's the highest ideal of like following yourself and your own dreams and who you are. We live in a day where we exalt the self. What we don't exalt is self-sacrifice. Uh, and so we'll look at marriage as this obligation. It's a bunch of servitude. Uh, and, and immediately I've like, I, I see these lies and immediately want to smash them with a hammer. Uh, but I'm like, hey guys, yeah, you may escape marriage, but it's like as a, uh, or any of those close, deep attachments that can help in life, but it'd be like a turtle escaping its shell. I'm free! And you're going to run into all these terrible things. Tonight, what I wanted to do is I wanted to contrast some of those cultural lies with some scriptural truths. It will not be hard to a, just in a verse, you can eviscerate these stupid lies. But then what I want to do is I want us to hang out and find a gratitude for what we got in marriage. We got a lot of lies, and I don't want to just point out the lies. I want to point out what we got. I was thinking about this today. That lack of gratitude is a real sin in the eyes of the Lord. Like kill you type sin. Really upsetting. Uh, I was thinking of the Israelites. They escaped from Egypt. God did them a solid. Did a whole bunch of supernatural plague stuff. Looked really awful. Escaped supernaturally. You guys are free. You didn't even work for it. Just boom. Freedom. Watch the Lord work. And rather than being super grateful, uh, every time that they, things look scary, they whine and complain and bicker. Right? Right? And the Lord gets upset. He doesn't like that. He wants us to be grateful for what he's done. Then food's running out. Immediately they are whining, whining, whining. And the Lord hooks them up again. Uh, with supernatural food from heaven. It's like, man, 
That's all. You don't have to grow it. You don't have to hunt it. You don't have to kill it. You don't have to skin it. You don't have to, just it's done. There you go. Buffet everywhere you look. That's amazing. But then they're like, I want different kinds of food. And then they whined about that. And God's like, move over, Moses. I'm going to kill them all. And Moses is like, please don't, Lord. And the Lord worked through that prayer as was always his plan to do so. Uh, however, it, what I saw is the Lord being enraged by their lack of gratitude and their whining, their complaining, and their bickering. To him, it was a, um, a capital offense in its sincerity. And I'm like, man. I complain all the time. I should probably not complain that much. Now, I'm doing a lot better these days, but I'm trying to get you to lean in and be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I do complain. I shouldn't. I will get better, God willing, in the future. Uh, but I think a lot of us will complain about some of the marital woes and some of the difficulties. Because, yeah, it's hard. You, always, you already know how it's hard. I want to talk about how it's good. Better still... I want to talk about how marriage is great and it actually sets you free. What that means, we're going to go through some stuff and you're going to be looking at yourself and your spouse and be like, hey, we got a good thing. And I just say, yes, you do. You got a really good thing. Marriage, when done right, God's way sets you free. How many of you know that God's all about freedom? I just told you a story where he literally sprung a whole nation uh, in slavery into freedom. And Jesus says, come to me, it is for freedom that I have set you free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, right? And so God is about setting captives free. Freedom. Marriage, when done right, sets you free. Everybody look at your spouse, just kind of like one of those. Actually, no, let's not do it kind of a little bit. I want you, I want you to look at her with like that smolder, like, and then you say, thanks for setting me free, baby. Go ahead, do that. In faith for what I'm going to say. Go ahead. How many of you felt that? Some of you dudes are like, it's going to be a good night. My bro. My bro. This is what you got. This is why you are freer than you know, and you have great cause for gratitude. Marriage is such a gift. Here's one reason. It is a cure for loneliness with the highest intimacy possible. Oneness. Oneness. The two become one flesh. That's the highest form of intimacy. Uh, that's possible. It sets us free from loneliness. Uh, I've experienced loneliness in my life as a young soldier. I almost got shot and killed a lot. And then I'm kind of like, that's not fun. And then you get back and you're like, I would like someone pretty and soft to, you know, do life with. And we'll get a little house and I won't get shot at. And that'll be awesome. And so I didn't have anyone. And I was on the prowl. Something about almost dying a lot makes you want to snuggle up with someone and not almost die all the time. And so... I was on the prowl. I was, I was lonely. In preparing for this talk, though, uh, I, was, I was hanging out with the Fredericks and the Misses. And in just a moment of realization, I'm like, I really haven't, I don't think I've had a lonely moment in years. I'm not lonely. Like, I am never, ever lonely. Um, whereas I used to be. And I, I've got to thank God for this. I've got to thank my wife for this. My boys who fill me with joy. Um, I, I, loneliness has been utterly cured through the deepest intimacy possible. Through oneness. The, the world doesn't know this. Uh, here, here's some statistics. I, I don't, I'm not usually a statistics guy, but tonight I'm doing the statistics thing. It's a new thing. Just go with me. All right. Uh, a survey data, uh, data from 2019 shows that 58% of Americans often feel like no one in their life knew them well. 58% of people don't feel like anyone actually really knows them. Just small talk, chit chat, work stuff. Hey neighbor, how's it going? See you later. 58%, no one really knows me at all. 
Uh, another one, startling survey by Harvard, which I have no respect for anywhere, by the way. A startling 61, everyone's woke and awful, you know. <laughs> I'm not your preacher, I just say whatever I want. All right, startling. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Georgia, and you got to deal with all the fallout, you know, so. <laughs> I, I looked at him like, can I still stay, though? <laughs> A startling 61% of young people aged 18 to 25, get this, reported miserable degrees of loneliness. Miserable degrees of lo loneliness is a very, very serious problem. And a lot of you didn't know that because you don't feel that. It's because your spouse has set you free from this problem. And this oneness, this intimacy which is safeguarded by the next thing, which is the foundation for such romance that Hollywood could never write a love story like the declaration just our normal covenant gives us through marriage. Hollywood's never dreamed of something of that stubborn and fierce kind of love. But that oneness, uh, that intimacy allows us through the marital contact, uh, co um, covenant to really be fully known and to really know someone else, warts and all. You know, all her bad stuff, all your bad stuff. And we get together and we say, no matter what, I'm not leaving, baby. And she looks back and says, yeah, me neither. Uh, and then you just go through our first couple years. We did that, didn't we, baby? I found out a lot about me. I found out I was a lot more selfish than I thought I was. Um, and, and that was something that we had to work through. More on that later. Let me jump into our next point. I get excited. I jump ahead like a dog with a bow. You throw three tennis balls. I'm like, I don't know. We, I want all the tennis balls. Second, second point here. <laughs> you guys are sitting on the highest form of romance ever conceived of uh, above or below here on earth. And that's the marriage covenant. Listen to how romantic this is, baby. I promise to love you no matter what. Whether we get rich or whether we're poverty poor, uh, whether you get real sick and you cancer and bald head, wheelchair stuff, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how miserable I get, if we get supremely unhappy, I promise to love you then. No matter what, forever, forever and ever and ever. It's not predicated on my feelings. It's not predicated on my, my circumstances. I declare I will love you no matter what forever. And that right there is just simple Christian marriage. I didn't say a single thing other than, yeah, that's how God did it. That's the plan for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, baby, you and me forever. That's romance compared to all these love stories on the silver screen that really is, it's all about the hunt and the chase and then they lived happily ever after because they have no idea how to write a story of forever after. They just know how to hunt and then they have no idea how to keep a girl once you catch her. And the stories just abruptly end. They don't know how to actually do marriage well. But the Bible does. And you have, you're sitting on the highest form of romance that allows intimacy and oneness to actually happen. So congratulations. Where the world's marriage and relationship is based on feeling. It's just based on feeling. I promise to love you as long as you make me feel like loving you. When it's not going so well, you'll tell a counselor and you'll tell your circle of friends, well, he just doesn't make me happy anymore. And these worthless, idiotic friends will say, oh, well, if he doesn't make you happy, it immediately falls like a house of cards because most marriages are a house of cards. It's not anchored on anything. Certainly nothing strong like this, the marital covenant. It's what allows intimacy to happen. If, you're, if, if your significant other, whoever you're shacking up with, playing house with for a few years, just try them on for size, 
If, if things start going sideways, they'll pop smoke, leave, go somewhere else. So knowing that at any moment they may leave, you never really show them the real you. It's all just a, a, you hold a lot back and they hold some back. You can't be truly vulnerably yourself because there's always the possibility they'll leave, right? So the world has no idea the bond, the oneness, and the foundation that you know. You take it for granted. It's there. I'm like, man, the world has no idea what it's missing and that you have. Be grateful. Here's another one. And this one is a blessing, but it doesn't feel like one. Uh, <laughs> you are free from the selfishness trap. You're free from the selfishness trap. You can't stay with where you got. See, I got married and I felt like a pretty selfless guy. At this point, I had something that no other college students had. I had some money. I was in the military doing some stuff. And when I went to college, I had like GI Bill and I was working a job. So I could, I could buy hot dogs and ramen noodles. They had to borrow my ramen noodles and hot dogs. But I, and, and I had all this time. I remember watching the TV series Lost. You all see that? I'd come home from class and I'd watch like four episodes and just popcorn and doing whatever I want. It's my time. Then I got married and I realized I no longer have me time. It's us time. So, you know, get married, you're kind of settling in and I'm like, all right, we're married. And that's very good. Okay, cool. Wonderful. I'm going to catch the show. She's like, oh, what are we watching? I'm like, well, I'm going to get my lost on. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> and that doesn't go well. That didn't go well at all. <laughs> Baby, what's the first movie we watched together? Conan, Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> 17 years. I've never watched anything like that. That was a kind of a one-off. One-off. You got to consider your spouse in everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. play the uh, eat out game. I'm just going to go, let's get a quick bite to eat. Men, right? And if me and you, if us dudes, we wanted to hop in a truck and we'd go do that, we'd have no problem. Like the first person to recommend something, we'd be like, yeah, all right, that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Dudes, you try to take your bride out to eat and everything you say she doesn't want, you playing that game? It's the original sin. Eve had no idea what to eat. <laughs> no idea what to eat. And Adam, so tired of it, he's just whatever you want, whatever you want. Apple, sure, forbidden fruit, I don't care. I'm just tired of. <laughs> I'm totally not being going to be invited back. <laughs> that was a joke. All I'm saying is, is now every decision is filtered instead of selfish me. It's what it, what it would my wife like. Uh, how can I serve her? How can I love her? It took a couple years for me to actually grow as a person to be better and less selfish. And then marriage would work. And she had her junk to uh, deal with too. She was dealing with the same selfishness stuff. I was uh, uh, brash and rude and she was uh, ready to be uh, controlling. And so we both had junk that we had to do, but Really what it was is we had to grow and become better people so that marriage would work. It can't be hopelessly broken, hopelessly broken. We put it together and somehow it's like, everything's great. Now, nope, that doesn't work. The math doesn't work, right? Broken plus broken is just double broken. That's all. We had to actually grow as people. Finally, year three, we hit a stride. The Lord grew us. I was better at considering my wife and actually enjoying. I'm like, I'm not about my hobby. It's like, let's do stuff together, baby, and finding some common ground. It's like give and take and stuff. And sometimes I'm watching like Downton Abbey. Dudes, if, how many of you have watched Downton Abbey? With your, that's because you love your wife. None of you care about, it's a show about nothing. Lord Grantham loses his dog. That's the show. Lost his dog. No, it just means you're not selfish anymore. Good job. You're loving your wife. You watch Downton Abbey. You guys are a credit to our sex. Way to go. 
When, um, we did better in year three. Year four, even better still. Year five, we're hitting a stride and we're like, we are awesome at marriage. We're growing. It's like this huge slope. It was kind of like honeymoon. You know, a month. All right, guy, real bad. It was real hard. Climbing up, climbing up. Oh, we're crushing it. Kids. <laughs> Some are laughing too hard at that. Kids are a blessing from the <laughs> kids are a blessing from the Lord, and we love our kids. And I say it like that to get a rise out of you. It's fun. Uh, but what I found in that area is, is all of a sudden I have to find a new level of selflessness that I didn't have. Now of like, uh, I'm, I got real jealous for my wife's time as well. And the baby in the first year, it's all about the baby. And I'm, she's keeping the baby alive and I'm taking care of her and baby and, and whatever else. And then kind of like, all right, baby's down. What do we do? And she's like, <sighs> This is Becca upset. She's like, I do not snore. No, you don't. But it was funnier to do the snore. <laughs> she doesn't snore. She looks like an angel when she sleeps. You're welcome, baby. Next thing, <laughs> next thing is God, give, you know, God gives us this gift of marriage. It makes us holy. It forces us to be selfless. We are better servants and equipped, and you have your spouse to thank for that. That's actually a really, I mean it sincerely, though I jest and have some fun at it. Uh, I thank the Lord that my wife has been such a tremendous vehicle to make me a more selfless man, more fit to be a better friend, a better leader, and a better follower of Jesus Christ as I declare his, nation, his greatness to the nations. Who do I have to thank for that? My wife, who has helped me. I got chill bones. Who has helped me so immensely uh, become a better man. I would not be the man I am without my wife. And the Lord has used her in that. And you are free from your own enslaving selfishness because of your spouse. So thank you. Thank your wives. Thank your husbands. Some of you wives think it's just you. No, I'm on to your game. You girls, you're just as bad as us. It's just different. It's the sins of dogs and cats. We're just different, but we're both bad and only Jesus is good. All right, moving on. <laughs> the next thing, legacy. You are freed through your marriage from the pointless rat race. The circus of the absurd. The world out there is thinking that it's through their vocation that they'll have legacy. That's where they're going to make it count. What did you do with your life? I was the CEO of blah, blah, blah company that won't be in business in 30 years. You want to write your name across the sky as if that's the legacy. But no matter what titan of industry you find, when they're on their deathbed, they're not going to call for their balance sheets. They're going to want to be surrounded by family. And that's the litmus test. That one fact alone lets us know what is a sure legacy. You don't want to bring, together, bring in front of you the accolades. You just want more time with the people that you love and love you too. It's legacy. And what your marriage ensures is that you're building a legacy together through your family that the world has no idea how important that is. Unfortunately, for most of them, because they won't yield to biblical wisdom, they're going to find out that they wasted their lives at the very end of their lives. That's when they'll find out. You have been freed, uh, freed from that trap because your legacy you're sitting next to them. That's your legacy. It means at the end of your days, surrounded by your wife and your children, hopefully, God may not see us to the end, but we, are, we have a sure legacy. You can look into the eyes of your kids and say, yeah, this was a life well lived. This was worth it. Go on. Here's my arrows, sending them out, right? Goes on. Legacy. Last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, that you got a helper in each other. Uh, the Bible says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I mean it in that, hey, both of us help each other out. One's down and the other uh, is up and then vice versa. I, I noticed that in our own marriage. 
You know, I'm having a bad day on something and she's up. She's actually got some energy and she's able to minister to me. And then vice versa. I mean it in that way. For some of you who are like, well, the gender roles, the man's supposed to lead and the woman's the helper. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I understand that. And uh, I completely agree with that. And we have covered it in other talks. So I don't really need to build theological foundation for that uh, as well. Man leads, she is the helper. It is not good for man to be alone, um, as our statistics even uh, show. But um, I remember years ago, um, I was working a job that I really hated. I didn't feel fulfilled in it. Uh, and for lack of a better word, I think I was just downright depressed. And I was grinding this out. And no matter how hard I worked, I just couldn't pay the bills. We're just totally broke. And I'm here, I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can. And I hate what I do. I hate it. And I didn't have any other options. I felt trapped. And I put on a strong face. I said, suck it up, buttercup. And I did just that. I kept working month after month after month until I don't know what it was. One day, I just kind of snapped, and I remember sitting on my front porch. You remember this, baby? I just sat on my front porch, and I felt like I just got nothing left. And Becca, right there, she was just a strength for me. She was an encouragement for me. When I just, I had reached the end of my strength, and she was strong for me. There, it, it's not like she gave me some great advice. She just put her arms around me, and she just told me she loved me, uh, and she encouraged me. And it was just that she was there that made the difference. And we made it through that season. And we found other hard seasons. And uh, I don't know what's coming down the pipeline, but I know you're for me and I'm for you. And we got a good team. Um, and I love that I have a companion to go on an adventure with. I love that all my experiences that I have I've got her beside me. I like that somebody's in all the pictures with me when I travel, you know? I, I, I like that we laugh together and we cry together. I have a companion. Uh, I, I have a helper. Um, and you are freed in that way too, that you don't have to do it alone, right? Uh, I'm a practical guy, so hey, after giving you some, hey, here's some pump you up encouraging things, I wanted to just expand out a few of these things and leave you with something kind of practical that you guys can do with this. But mainly this has been about, hey, let's have gratitude, let's see marriage different, because with all the cultural lies that we see on TV and in movies, we need to hear over and over the truths and the things to be grateful about so if we can have a good attitude about it, we can go into a better marriage. You notice every movie is a toxic marriage? Like marriage, I don't really see anyone. The last one I saw, it, it, I, I couldn't understand why I liked this movie. It was a movie called The Natural. It was with Robert Redford and it was a baseball movie. He's kind of like a middle-aged dude that's been in a different career. He had a natural knack for baseball. You've seen this, Pastor? He had a natural knack for baseball. Uh, and as like a middle-aged man in the middle of career, he got to go at it. And he's like, I think I'm going to go do baseball stuff. And then he like makes major league team. And then he plays a game. And it's just unheard of. that we'd, I don't give a rip about this story. I don't like baseball. I definitely don't like sports movies. I don't care about it. But I found myself really liking this movie and I didn't know why I liked it. And then I was able to pinpoint it after watching. It's that his wife was so sweet and encouraging through it. And I really, they, they really struck me as a team, shoulder to shoulder, trying to figure something out, bearing each other's burdens. And I saw that in that movie. And once I saw it, I'm like, ah, oh, that was refreshing. And then I realized it has been a very long time since I saw the healthy husband-wife team in any movie. Usually she, she's uh, henpecking him because he doesn't pull his weight. She makes a joke at his expense and he makes some snide comment there and they're at each other's throats and the, the fire is gone. 
And it's such a fiction. It's not my experience at all. Uh, but I see those cultural lies, and I want to combat them with uh, the truths that we've already gone through. Listen, you got a helper. Don't speak bad about them. Women get together in these circles, and they trash talk their husband. In the South, we have kind of like our prayer circles. And so as long as you say your complaint about your deadbeat husband in the guise of a prayer request, you can vent unlimited toxicity. So pray for that. <laughs> it's the Southern prayer chain right there. It's the gossip circle. Don't speak bad about them. Encourage your spouse. Encourage means to breathe life into them. And that's what you have the power to do. You can encourage your spouse. You could be a fantastic helper. You got that opportunity. Selfishness. We've been freed from our own pieces of depravity as God uses marriage as an instrument to make us holy rather than happy. And the good news is, is if you get holy, happiness is accessible to you. You can't possibly, I, I wish I had time to unpack that, but I don't. So we'll move on. Let's serve each other without complaint. And let's ditch the, re the ledger. Let's ditch the record. You know how we do that? It's because we're fallen humans. I did such and such and such and such. So would you mind doing these things for me? It's as if we're keeping this score sheet in our minds of what the other one is doing. Instead, folks, let's continue to grow in selflessness and let's try to outperform each other and not keep a log. That's gonna be really hard to do. Dudes, you lead the way in this. God has made us strong and long suffering so that we could bear burdens heavier. You're not supposed to take it 50-50. You're supposed to be the stronger of the two. It means I can run on less sleep than my spouse. I can lift more and work harder for longer. It's part of being a dude. So bear more of the burden, right? Gals, you serve too. You, know, you notice you always make a honey-do list for him, but he never does for you. What's that about? It doesn't seem fair. You ever got a honey-do list from the husband? I don't think that's fair, girls. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Romance. Protect intimacy. Protect intimacy. Let's make sure that our wives are the standard of beauty in our own lives, that no little foxes are taking our attention and our desires elsewhere. So we save everything up for our spouse. Uh, let's make sure that we don't deprive each other except by mutual consent and even then only for a short time so then you can come back together. Sometimes you're not going to feel like it. Do it anyway. You might find your way along the way. Be in good shape for each other. Love each other with your bodies. Invest in date nights. Uh, it's a, babysitters are a lot less expensive than divorce attorneys. There's a pro tip. You're welcome. Date each other, right? Date each other. It's a good idea. Uh, Beck and I do this, and it is wonderful. A, uh, at least one, two, three-ish times a year, we'll do an overnight away. Usually this happens on our anniversary. We'll get away for two or three nights. And it's just me and her. We ditch the kiddos, just with whoever. <laughs> get out of here, kids. Just... No. <laughs> uh, that's what grandparents are for, right? So uh, anyway, but we do a, a, a few nights overnight, just the two of us. And man, I can, I can roll on that for months, you know? What that re breathes into our marriage. What I found when we do that a few times a year, we get to be playful again, like we're a bunch of newly, well, like we're a couple newlyweds or we're newly dating and all the responsibilities and obligations fall the wayside and we're not stressed out. No one's worried about headspace and we're just kind of kids again. We're staying in hotels. So it's like, let's wreck this place knowing we don't have to clean anything. Nothing. Purposefully. I'm not taking my shoes off when I come in. I don't care. I don't have to clean this place, you know? So uh, anyway, some of those overnights are really, really good. Figure out ways to 
consistently on purpose make room for your spouse so that you can be intimate and connect to each other apart from all the tasks of survival and caring for the home and doing the work stuff and all the demands of life, you need to be able to steal away and just remember each other. Intimacy, oneness, closeness. Then you put on some, uh, nope. I saved myself. There you go. And then you can get it on. Uh, Legacy. I said it anyway. Legacy. This is where you, and this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to talk about, and we're done for the night. I'll let you guys uh, go on and uh, do family stuff. Uh, make memories together. This is, uh, I want your phone just filled up with Rolodexes of real cool stuff. This is tough for me in that, man, I'm, I'm juggling all kinds of stuff. Of like, I got multiple companies that I'm running, and I'm serving in my church. And I'm a dad and I'm a husband. And a lot of days I'll come through and I'm just so waxed. It's all I can do to just sit there like mind numb and not snap at someone for asking me another question. I have solved all the problems I'm able to. I've reached the end. I have no more words or thoughts. I'm I'm crafting a really like, I'm crafting a picture of how I'll get occasionally when I'm just burned out. And usually if you're in blinking red light burnout, you just need to get away from everyone because you're going to be awful. So steal away for an hour or two, self-preserve, you know, put on that oxygen mask, breathe a little bit, pray, and then come back in when you got some juice. But I'm just saying it's easy to get caught up in all the tasks you're doing and just never really have that energy and make that time. If that's you, you probably need to dial back a little bit on work or Instead of having a lot of time around your family that isn't really quality time, make a scheduled time where you're going to go do one real special memorable thing with them one or two times a week. You know, so go do that one thing. I'm like, oh, we're going to go horseback riding as a family in the mountains. I'm like, yeah, and that's going to be like my big thing. I'm going I'm to build a memory. I'm going to go camping or so, so whatever it is. Uh, uh, but it's not just, maybe what I'm saying is it's not good enough to just log time around your family. I would encourage you to think out, make a plan of like, all right, in two weeks from now, I want to build this one memory. What did you wish your dad did with you when you were a kid? Go do that with them. Build memories. Go on trips. Uh, do whatever you can, but uh, build memories, right? If you got it, say, I got it. Awesome. You guys are a blessing. Uh, And I thank the Lord that he has given us each other so that he could set us free from all kinds of stuff. Are you grateful for your spouse? Are you grateful for your family? You encouraged? You go out the door like that? Let's go to the Lord and thank him. Uh, Jesus, we thank you so much for our families For those in the room that are not married, I pray special blessing on them that if it be your will that they would find a spouse, uh, that you would begin preparing them and that other person as well. Help them have discernment as they select that spouse, understanding what marriage is. And for all those who are married, I pray that you would breathe renewed vigor and intimacy, oneness, romance, selflessness, uh, that you would whisper thoughts of deep legacy and connection into our hearts and let us know that you've really blessed us in ways that we didn't even imagine so that we can say uh, blessings of gratitude about our spouse, to speak encouragingly to them and of them. And we thank you for all that you've given Jesus. In your name, amen.